morning. I'm Gilbert Gottfried, and this is Gilbert Gottfried's Amazing Colossal Podcast, and I'm here with my co-host, Frank Santo Padre. Our guest this week is a prolific and versatile actor who's been in dozens of films, including Jesus Christ Superstar, Harry Antonto, Sophie's Choice, The Money Pit, Star 80, Big Daddy, Radio Days, and City Slickers. He's worked with everyone from Art Carney to Tom Hanks and has been directed by the likes of Woody Allen, Bob Fosse, Paul Mazursky, and Oliver Stone. He also happens to be the son of one of the great comedic actors of his generation, the legendary Zero Mostel. Please welcome a man who's played everyone from Herod the Great to Bluto Blatarsky's brother, our pal, Josh Mustel. Yay! <laughs> You're going to pipe in applause there. Oh, yes. <laughs> oh, okay. yes. Yeah. We can, Ooh, we can put it in. Must, Mustel. Ooh, ooh. Yeah, so great. my, my so, first question. Yes. My has, first answer. Yes. Oh, this is exciting. Has, has anybody in your entire life ever said to you, funny, you don't look Jewish? <laughs> Gee. <laughs> uh, well, that's a... Um, you know, I don't think that's happened. And strangely enough, I'm not Jewish. <laughs> I'm not. You're I mean, not? This is do I have so to weird. leave or something? I mean, yeah, to, I'm, I'm sorry. We oh, only okay. have Jews. Oh, on the show. Well, yeah, well, it is a show business. Now, so, because your father... <laughs> yeah, Zero he was, he he, was Jewish. He, he was He was, a, he was Tevye, for God's but sake. But he married a, a woman, uh, an Irish Catholic, originally. Yeah. She claimed Judaism. She announced she was Jewish, but I think it's a little more formal than that. You don't just get to claim Judaism. Yeah. So, uh, you know, I always thought of myself as Jewish, but when I was doing Superstar, I was in a, I was a really obnoxious uh, guy who was one of the apostles who's, who was uh, an Israeli, and uh, his roommate told me that uh, if they had a 6 o'clock call, he would set the alarm for 4 and then keep hitting snooze 12 times because he wanted to wake up every 10 minutes. You know, some, he was just a really obnoxious guy. And I was mouthing about saying, he says, tell me, are you Jewish, Mustel? And I said, well, I'm half Jewish, sister. Half Jewish? No, no. Is is your mother Jewish? I said, well, my father was Jewish. My mother was. Jewish. You're not Jewish. <laughs> it's like, okay, uh, if that's the way we're going to be about it. I, but my mother, my mother, you know, she would have been Jewish if you know your if mom, you could just sign something. Your mom was a chorus girl. Do we have that? She right? was seventh from the left on uh, the Rockettes. Uh huh. She was all legs, and I have. You want you you want show business stories, right? Oh yes. Okay, we'll I, take them if you got them. When she died, uh, my 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 brother looked in her uh, um, pocketbook, and there was an envelope from the Players Club, club, and it said, "Katie, you louse, you left me alone with Wally Cox." Underlined three, <laughs> le, underlined three times. <laughs> But you were funny, 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 and your crotch is the supplest. X, 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 Marlin. Wow. Oh, my God. That's enough. Should I go now? Wow. That's the best story. You yeah, believe? Marlin. That my top. Yeah. That wow. my... And they loved Marlon, my parents. They, they worshipped Marlon. He was one of the few people they would, you know, turn on the TV for and stuff like that. Marlon Brando and my mom. And I always said I was his son, and Zero was just like, you know, the nameplate. <laughs> I don't know. We could do a DNA thing. Or, uh, Stella! Or whatever. Something. Now, sir. I, as is always the case yes. with my guests, I have to tell them to shut up before we start recording. Because they have the greatest stories. Oh. And you told me a story about a Groucho Marx. Oh, yeah, Groucho. <laughs> Um, in college, my best friend was Scott Johnson, and his father was Nunnally Johnson, who was one of the first, you know, triple threat guys. Great Hollywood. screenwriter, director. Yeah, writer, yeah. director, yeah. producer. And um, he and Groucho were great friends. And uh, Scott got married, 
and um, invited me to the wedding, and I drove cross country to this wedding, and I was a hippie. I had I had hair and I had a beard, and I probably smelled bad, but you get used to it. <laughs> and you know, a dress terrible. Anyway, I walk into this mansion in Beverly Hills, and uh, you know, all dirty and everything. And there's there's Groucho with Nunnally, and Groucho looks up and sees me and says to Nunnally, "Is that the bride?" <laughs> I hope that's not the bride. Anyway, but uh, I, I, I wasn't the bride, and those rumors are false. Okay. What about rumors about Brando and Wally Cox? There were, you know there were rumors for years. Now that you brought yeah, them up. Well, I'll, I'll tell you what I heard. Uh-huh. I mean, he loved Wally Cox. Yeah. He thought Wally Cox was the funniest man. And I think Wally perhaps had more testosterone than, than, than Brando because Wally, well, I, I didn't know Wally Cox, but he was, a, 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 you know, a little self-assured. I mean, he wasn't the character he played. Mr. But Peepers. He was a funny guy. Yeah. Mr. Peepers, yeah. yeah. Mr. Peepers, but, uh, but with an edge. And, and, and Frank and I were talking that we have something sort of in common of having to try to follow in the footsteps of the original Saturday Night Live. In that I, had, I was in the uh, cast right after the original cast left, and oh. so, and you uh, were in Delta House, yes, where you had to uh, fill in for uh, John Belushi, yes, which was an impossible job to do. And when yes, and I and I did it impossibly. <laughs> yeah, I, well, I, I did it. I mean, you know, they paid me. It wasn't a hit. No, he was like, yeah, because yeah. it was the TV version of Animal House. Yes. And what's funny about that is that, that great bad TV writing in that they said you, they wrote you as the younger brother of John Belushi's <laughs> character <laughs> in the movie. Yeah. yeah. And then later on, you would be in City Slickers 2 meeting the totally unknown, untalked about, a twin brother of Jack Palance. <laughs> yeah, Curly's <character>. brother. <laughs> right. Right. I got I got some Jack Palance stories. Oh, absolutely. Here, but they, yeah. they're, they're a little dirty. Oh. <laughs> we'll be back after yeah. this moment. No. Uh, oh, so, please. So he he's a weird guy, but he's a wonderful actor. And we were sitting on City Slickers 1, and, and somebody mentioned Marlon Brando. Uh, not Marlon Brando. Where's my head? Uh, Marilyn Monroe. And uh, he said, oh, I used to know Marilyn. I said, did you ever fuck her? Yeah. You know, and he went, I remember once I was in L.A. And it was teeming with rain. Rain was pouring down. (laughs) At about three at night, the phone rang. So I knew who it must be. And I picked up the phone and said, hello, Marilyn. And she said, oh, Jack, Jack, have you seen it outside? It's so wonderful. I said, I noticed it's raining. She goes, come on over, Jack. We'll go for a drive. Come on over. So I got in my car and I went and I went over to Marilyn's place and she came out and she was wearing this tiny white dress. And she jumped in the car and we started driving up around where the Hollywood sign is and It was a big puddle. We were all alone. She said, Jack, Jack, stop here. And I stopped, and she jumped out of the car and ran into this puddle in front of the headlights of the car, twirling around with the rain pouring down on her in that little white dress. Uh, That's the whole story. It's a a shaggy... Shaggy dog story, but it's uh, the, the, there's one more. Uh, oh, I love the I, I have of, 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 uh, of Jack Palance. Um, I had always heard that Jack and my father had gotten to a fist fight. Oh, right? they were in panic in the streets. They were in together. panic in the streets. Together. Well, right. you're up on your stuff. Well, I do Frank? my best. Yeah. Aside from well, the peyote reference, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you spent too much time watching movies instead of creating absolutely, your own in your mind. Absolutely. Anyway. Um, so uh, um, I, I, I said to Jack, so I, I always heard that the, you and Zero got into a fist fight. And Jack said, what? Who told you that? I said, no, I, I just heard it from a bunch of people. He said, no, no, I loved your dad. I, I loved him. I, I remember we were, we were on the set and, 
and I had this uh, uh, prop gun in my hand. You know, it wasn't loaded, and I was twirling it around, and Zero comes over and says, Hey, Jack, hey, you want me to give you a target? And, and I said, Sure. And he, he drops his pants. <laughs> <laughs> and he, he puts that big, beautiful pink ass <laughs> right in front of me. So just kidding around, I, I, I shot him with this empty prop gun, but the damn thing was loaded. <laughs> and Zero starts screaming, you shot me in the ass. You shot me in the ass. <laughs> oh, yeah, I, I loved your old man. <laughs> That's the other shaggy dog story from Jack Palance. <laughs> Great stuff. But ah. back to Delta House just for a second, and then, we'll, and then we'll House. move on past it. How, no, how did they approach Gilbert and I were talking about it before you got here. How, how did they approach you about this? Is the, the, you, did, did you immediately say, how the hell am I going to follow this? Of course not. I said, yeah. when do I show up and right. how much am I getting paid? <laughs> yeah, right. No, I auditioned. I, I knew I was going to get the part because they had me read the Belushi part. They mm-hmm. wanted Belushi. Yeah. You know? Right, and, sure. And everybody looked like Belushi except me. You know, I, I just dressed the way I normally do, which is sub Belushi. And um, it, 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 this audition, it's the thing where he says, follow me, and he runs out and nobody follows him. You know, he gives a big speech. And I gave the big speech, and it was really good. And I gave the big speech, and I ran out the, of the room, and I slammed the door behind me. And then I heard the producer going, come back, come back. And then I knew I had the part. Nice. Yeah. There were three series that, that, that season, know, three, three frat house shows based it, on it's Animal the, House. It's the damn wife of the producer. That's the fault. Who's the fault is? Because she, she told uh, Maddie Simons. Maddie Simmons, yeah. Simmons, yeah. one of the founders. She of told life. Maddie, says, oh, we can't, you, you can't use Delta, you know, you can't use Animal House name because what if we make a sequel? It'll d- take back away from the sequel. He goes, oh, well, I married you. I might as well listen to you or something. And uh, they, they called it Delta House. And... Yeah, you know, there were three series. We were the one that had all the actors. Yeah, you had Stephen First and John Vernon and, yeah, yeah. and Bruce Those McGill, guys. D-Day. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, you know, but... Uh, you had the best chance of the three. We had the best <laughs> chance. But, uh, and no, it didn't work. And uh, we're still waiting for the sequel. But I thought they should have called us Animal House because, I don't know. That's what it was. That's what it was. Yeah, yeah. They didn't yeah, call. Yeah, 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 yeah. They didn't call the odd couple by a different name on the, yeah, the series. Yeah, the, the strange ones. Yeah, you know, or the uh, the the uh, misaligned couple. Uh, you know, just so. I, I anyway. think I think Walter Matthau one time said that some woman came up to him in uh, in the street and said. And she said to me, I love you in that movie, The Queer Couple. <laughs> <laughs> now, uh, can, can we talk a little, of course, about your father? Of the course, great, why not? The great Zero Mostel. The great Zero Mostel. Shot in the ass, but other than that, he had a <laughs> wonderful life. It reminds me of the gag in Blazing yeah. Saddles. <laughs> he says, the little bastard shot me in the ass. Now, we we were talking about your your father was blacklisted. Oh boy! Yeah, he used to say, "I'm a man of a thousand faces, all of them blacklisted." <laughs> yeah, but I've heard you say he wasn't a communist. Well, uh, you know, I've said a lot of things, but uh, <laughs> no, I you know he never admitted to being communist right, to me. Right, right. But he, I, I, you know, he might not have been officially because. He was broke. He probably didn't have enough money to pay the dues. Um, the, they always said that you could tell who the FBI guys were because they paid their dues. Right. And none of the com- uh, communists won't pay dues. Come on. But I, I don't know if he was officially in the party, but he, he, he backed a lot of left-wing causes. I mean, he was not, uh, he was not a, a right-winger. Sure. My dad. And did he talk about uh, what it was like when it was just everyone turned their backs on him? Well, not everyone. You couldn't work. I mean, yeah. you know, you couldn't do TV. You could do Broadway. You could do your, your stand-up act. He did a lot of stand-up. Yeah. It did Laurel and the Pines and, you know, the Catskills. But um, the people that never 
turned their back on you were the fellow blacklisties. They, uh, they were all, that's all they had was the fact that they weren't informers. I remember um, Clifford Odets, informer. Mm-hmm. There should be a chorus yep. of people. Yeah. Whenever you mention you know, Jerry Robbins, <laughs> informer. <laughs> right. um, anyway, Kazan. Clifford Odets was an informer and, and was, was friends with, uh, with uh, you know, uh, my father and, and, and that whole set. And uh, when he informed, like, everyone chunned him or tried to. And, you know, of course, he worked. Um, and then Zero was doing a funny thing, and Sam Jaffe, who was my godfather, uh, Gunga Din. Yo, we just uh, talked about yeah, him on the show last week with Ed Asner. And, and yeah, Dr. Zorba. Dr. Zorba, yes. sure. Uh, yeah. well, he was sure. also a gem of a person. But anyway, uh, Clifford Odets came backstage to say hi to my father when Zero was in a funny thing. And uh, Sam was in the dressing room, and when Clifford Odets walked in... Sam got up and walked to the corner of the room and put his nose in the corner of the room and wouldn't turn around until Clifford Odets left. My father said hi, but see, the, those blacklisted actors, all, all, uh, Sam wasn't blacklisted, but he was, you know, friends of all of them. Um, all they had was their belief that they did the right thing and the others did not do the right thing. And uh, it's funny. I, I'll tell you another. This, this is... This is one of the great stories of all time, as long as we're on this blacklisting uh, topic. Um, Ilya Kazan, informer. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Ilya yeah. Kazan, also known as Gadge, was a good friend of my father's. In fact, he directed Panic in the Streets. Right, that's right. With Jack Plant. That's right. And Zero. And um, let's see. Uh, um, in his book, he talks about being an informer. He says, you know, I didn't like those people. They were all didactic, and I, I don't care that they didn't like me. The one exception was Zero Mostel, who was a very nice guy and very funny. And I kind of, you know, anyway, he says, I was walking down the street about six months after my testimony, and I hear a bellow from across the street, Gedge, and it's Zero. And I, I run, uh, he runs over across the street and, and hugs me. A little too hard, and then we go uh, and we have coffee. And I remember, and he writes in his book, I remember looking at his face and seeing a certain sadness there. And he sort of implies that he felt a little bad, Gadge, right? Years later, uh, um, Burt Reynolds, I think it was, who was a friend of Gadge's, told me that when Zero hugged him, he broke two of his ribs. <laughs> wow, <laughs> funny stuff. Huh? I love that. <laughs> now, I I remember someone asked Paul Newman yes. about um Ilya Kazan. Right. And Paul Newman's answer was it, it was interesting. He said it's very easy now to say what you would have done back yes, then. Yes, of course, it's true. You know, the pajama game had a, a revival that was very good with uh, Harry Connick in it. And all of a sudden, there was a character in it who was, uh, who they were making fun of for being a very anti communist, you, know, uh, you know, a real. Yeah. And, and I thought, you're a little late, you know? Yes. This is, oh, it's not, it's very, it's very easy in retrospect to be. You know, well, we should point out that your dad that. testified famously. Yes. He gave me, but but he didn't inform. He no, he, he, he did he, not he, name names, and he made fun of them a little bit. Yeah, he confronted them, which, which yeah, a little bit. They cut, they for. Cut, at one point, uh, a senator called him. Uh, I think he testified before the House and the Senate, but I'm not exactly sure. But he said that a senator said something, and, and Zero said that he was a putz. And the senator said, "What was that?" And I said, "I called you a putz." He said, "What does that mean?" He said. My father said, it's a Yiddish term of endearment. <laughs> Funny. So, and that was all stricken from the record. So unless you're listening to this, you'll have no, no clue that such things happen. Gilbert and I were talking before. And didn't he say that, that if I, inf- I can't be an informer because if I inform, I can't be buried on sacred ground? Did he I sa- don't believe so. No, I, you, I did he not know, say maybe, that? Maybe. I said, you know, I could tell you, but I'd hate myself in the morning. Um. The guy said, I hope you listen to what we've told you. They said at the end of his testimony, he said, I hope you listen to what I've told you. Right. You know, I don't know. And, and it did him a lot of good. He didn't work for 30 years. We were poor ass. Well, you were born in 46, and he was blacklisted when? Oh, probably 
Oh, I don't know, 52? 50. Or, no, we, we, were, we were real poor growing up. I mean, yeah. You know, and then Zero hit it big on Broadway. I mean, you know, when he did Run Oscars and won a Tony, and then he did uh, A Funny Thing, which was a riot. And then he did A, a Fiddler, and then, you know, the producers. And then, and then he was, was rich and buying art and now, having what, a great what time. What I always wondered is, like, how come they didn't use him? He was the definitive. Oh, that's a good story. Tempia. And oh, I think because Zero was a pain in the ass. That's, that's <laughs> my belief. I remember I walked by, his, he was on the phone yelling at his agent saying, no, I want this and tell them that or they can go fuck themselves. And, I, and he's going on and on. And the next thing I heard, Topol was doing. Oh, you know, uh, you know, and I think Zero was shocked. I, I don't think Zero believed that it could be done without him. And, oh, I got a lot of stories about this. So anyway, Norman Jewison directed yeah. it. And, and yeah, it was probably a smart thing to do because... You know, it wasn't Zero Mostel's uh, uh, Fiddler yeah. on the Roof. It was Norman Jewison's Fiddler on the Roof. You know, it it wasn't all about Zero. But um, anyway, Tupple does it. So years later, um, um, uh, uh, David Merrick, the notoriously mm-hmm. shitheadness uh, uh, <laughs> producer on Broadway, uh, wanted to do Baker's Wife, a musical based on the French trilogy that... I think Marcel Pagnol was the, the lead. It was very brilliant. Um, and Zero loved it. And Zero wanted to do it. And uh, they were going to do this musical. And um, Zero, Zero and David were fighting over terms and this and that and the other thing. And Zero was impossible and David's impossible. And they don't do it. So we hired Tupple <laughs> to play the part. <laughs> and it was funny. a total flop. That's and funny. Tupple couldn't have been worse for the part. He just did it to... <laughs> Up yours, Zero. So, so then um, Zero was doing some movie that was never released in uh, in uh, in Mexico, and uh, I went to visit him. Right, and as soon as I got there, my agent called and said they want you to audition for Jesus Christ Superstar. Norman Jewison will fly you to L.A. and blah, blah, from Mexico to L.A. And when I was talking to my agent about this, Zero started screaming, "Tell him to hide!" Tupple, son! <laughs> They're not leaving! That's great. <laughs> That's great. Now, can I totally put sure. you on this spot? Yeah, yeah, I can walk out, too. Yes. <laughs> and, Ignore the sound of the and, ringing phone. And ask you... If it's my agent, tell them I'm, I'll, I'll get right back to... No, give it to me if it's my agent. Is it my agent? <laughs> Oh, it's not my agent. Oh, wait, I don't have an agent. Oh, I, go on. Sorry. Can, can you sing at least... Two lines from King of the Jews. The you, King Herod song? Yeah. I can sing the whole thing. Oh, what, are you please, kidding me? please. Can we have... What? You want me to do yes, it? Yes, Without my orchestra? I don't care. Without my bevy of <laughs> <Yeah>. beauties? <laughs> I am just, such a terrible Just a singer. couple of lines, Josh. Okay. okay. Jesus, I am overjoyed to meet you face to face. You are getting quite a name all around the place. Healing cripples... Raising from the dead. Now I understand you're God. At least that's what you've said. I got a belch. <laughs> <laughs> so, are you are the Christ. Yes, the great Jesus Christ. Proved me that you're divine. Change my water into wine. That's all you need to do. Then I'll know it's all true. Come on, king of the Jews. Great. <laughs> Terrific. Now, oh, God, now I Terrific. Yes. Thank you. I always like the line, uh, prove to me that you're no fool. Walk, Walk across, across my, my swimming, swimming pool. pool. Yes, maybe that was came there then. I don't know. I haven't done it in a while. And, and On request. Yeah, yeah, yeah. When was the last time somebody asked you to sing a couple of bars of from Jesus Christ Superstar? And, uh, I, don't, I don't think anyone's ever done it before. <laughs> <laughs> and it's funny watching you sing... Uh, it you could see you could definitely see your father in uh, that's what I've always movement. hoped for on stage yeah. that when I perform someone will see someone else yeah but, uh, but you know thank you I, I guess the now, part and, of it's and a Frank compliment and I, I'll thank you for yeah it, no it's a compliment yeah, great no. great compliment oh thank you because uh, uh, Frank and I were discussing that your father gave you some acting tips. How do you know this stuff? What have you been following me? Do a little research. Yeah, uh, well, he he always so said something about this a cough was, drop. Yeah, I know. I was getting there. Yeah, <laughs> he, uh, he 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 took me aside and said, "But 
before you go on stage, you must always suck on something red. <laughs> you know, because your tongue gets too white. And, and, you know, the lessons from the masters. You know, suck on something red, and we'll all be successful. Not to go back to the blacklist, but I just want to point out, sure, too, your, your dad's part in the front which is just a, a, a wonderfully s- yeah. a sad movie. I mean, and his part is Hecky Brown, which is basically he's playing somebody, I, I assume, based on himself, on his, uh, own, on his own life, or just an amalgam yeah, of, of different yeah, people. Yeah, it, it was a bunch of different people. Everybody yeah. in the movie had been black. Her, yeah, Herschel you know, I was in that movie? And, were you? Uh, yes, and they oh. cut me out completely. Oh, gee. Bastards. Yes. Yeah. yeah. They but, didn't want the other actors to be overshadowed. <laughs> no, uh, what happened was uh, Zero in the movie did his act. And uh, then, right before he kills himself, he goes and sees another comedian doing his act. I was the other comedian, stealing his act. But since they cut his act, they cut the guy stealing oh, his act. So uh, they just went right up to the window where he jumped out. It's a, it's a sweet, sad film. Yes, it is. And Herschel Bernardi and, and yes. uh, Walter Bernstein and Marty Ritt, and everybody was blacklisted. Yes, my mother, my mother when she saw it, uh, I, I found the most moving parts of it to be the years that the people were blacklisted. You know, you see a movie when they talk about the real thing, people at the end, that's always sometimes the best part. But uh, when Herschel's name came out, because when was he blacklisted? No one ever heard of Herschel Bernard. He wasn't blacklisted <laughs> back then. He was on a blacklisted Johnny come lately. But that was my mother. She, she wanted credentials, you know. <laughs> I would have heard of Herschel Bernardi in 1954. And, and you worked with Robert Mitchum. Mm. Mm-hmm. He gave me a... Yes, I did. I, well, I, my first job, I played Robert Mitchum's parole officer. And uh, they well, had me... A, I, you know, never done a movie before, never done anything before. What was the name of the film, John? Uh, it was called uh, Going Home. Mm-hmm. Going Home, yeah. That's, with Jan Michael you know, Vincent, be, right? Yeah, it might be Coming Home. You going home, me. going home, uh, going home. Yeah, and um, so they say, all right, go go down to to uh, uh, Wildwood, New Jersey, and uh, and here's the hotel, and take a bus, and we'll reimburse. Yeah, I get on the bus, I go into the hotel. Says, is there anything for Josh Mostel? And he, you know, and they say, no. And I go, oh, geez, what if I'm working? I mean, I said, oh, where's the production office? Tell me where the production office is. You know, I was afraid I had to yeah, start working. Yeah. And I said, well, it's right on the boardwalk. It's I said, okay. And I walk to the boardwalk, and there's the production office. And I walk in, and there are about four teletype machines, and no one is in there. And I'm, I'm what, what is going on? I mean, I'm, and I go out on the boardwalk, and I walk in, and I see Robert Mitchum. And I walk up to Robert Mitchum. I go, Robert, hi, I, I, I'm Josh Marcel. I play your parole officer, Pirelli. And I just wondered, you know, I, I went to the production office. There's nothing. There was nothing in the hotel. And I wonder if he says, son, <laughs> let me tell you something. Give you some advice. Go to a movie. Go to a bar. Do whatever you want. If they want you, they'll find you. <laughs> I thought, oh, that's interesting. So I, I just de-stressed and went back to the hotel or whatever. And uh, years later, when I was doing City Slickers, I had a day off, and uh, we were in Santa Fe, and I called, uh, I called David Pamer, who played my brother. And I said, David, you want to go to the movies uh, in, in Albuquerque? He said, sure. He, we're both not working. So I said, okay. And I, we got in my car, and we drive down to Albuquerque. We never told anybody. We had a day off. And uh, we're watching this movie. I forget what it was. And suddenly there's a tap on my shoulder. And I said, yeah. And someone says, are you Josh Mostel? I said, uh-huh. He said, call the office. <laughs> they wanted me. They found me. Uh, no, apparently, uh, as I was driving off, uh, the office said, you know, we're going to do that shot. We're going to need the boys. Does anybody have a 20 on them? And I said, well, I saw them driving south on the highway. <laughs> they must be going to a movie. Go to every movie theater and look for these two schmucks and bring them back. And they did. So Robert Mitchum was right. That's great. And yeah, i got to say one thing about Robert Mitchum. Um, you know, I, we, we did uh, his close-up first, and, uh, and he was very minimal, you know, not showing too much. And then they turned around and did my close-up. And his off st- I'm going to cry about this. His off-stage acting was the best acting I had ever seen in my life up to that point. He gave everything you could give another actor. That's pretty much 
I would say it was better than his performance for the film, was his performance for me. Trying to get anything out of this, like, newcomer to the business. No, he was quite a guy, I thought. Arrested for marijuana, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah sure, famously. Famous. Yeah. 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 And Jan Michael Vincent was the other was the other actor yes. in that film. Well, speaking, of it was marijuana. a father and son, son story, wasn't it? With 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 Mitchum, wasn't he a, an ex con or? Yes, yeah. he had he had he had he had killed uh, Jan, his wife, Jan Michael Vincent's mother, right? And gets out of jail twenty years later when the movie starts, and and they have a a bad time together. Now, now, Jan Michael Vincent, he seems like. He started out as a handsome James Dean type actor, and now and he just sort of became known as just like drugs and drinking and craziness. Was any of that back then? I we I went to his uh, his hotel room and uh, it was the most dope I'd ever seen. It was like it was like it was like there was the whole there were like seven people there. Each of them had. Two joints passing him left and right and up and down, and nobody was up and nobody was down. But it wow. was, and it wasn't even that good. The dope, I mean, but it was. I, I didn't feel stoned. I felt overwhelmed. By, like, maybe it was just the lack of oxygen or something, you know. But it was, it, it was something. Anyway, so um, back then, but he was nice too. <laughs> I'm thinking most people were, have been nice. Mark Metcalf wasn't nice, Which, but other than that, <laughs> oh, Mark Metcalf from Animal House. Yeah, he yeah, was yeah, a yeah. Uh, uh, Nieder, Niedermeyer. Yeah, yeah. yeah. You, you he was had... just like his character. He was a real prick. Interesting. <laughs> but hey, Mark, I'm just kidding. No, I'm not. Uh, anyway, and you worked with Art Carney. Mm. Art, Art would, uh, Art would do celebrity farts. <laughs> he would. He would. Celebrity he was, farts. Farts. He would. He was an incredible mimic. <laughs> I mean, he was an incredible clown. To Did begin you with. know I this mean, about Art Carney? No, no. Oh well, <laughs> you would say anybody, and he would imitate them saying a line, and then he would do their fart. <laughs> so he hated Arthur Godfrey. By the way, he hated him. So he'd start off with he said, "The Lipton Tea people." And he'd do a little dribbly fart. He said he would have a dribble fart. And then he would do a, you'd say John Wayne. He said, oh, he would have a robust fart. He would go, he would go, you know, I think that we should all get together. <laughs> oh, I didn't mean to spit at you, Gilbert. Oh, he's wiping spit off and laughing and everything. It's terrible here. Someone get the man a towel. So wow. he would do celebrity farts. He, and he was, but he would do precise and great <laughs> imitations of the people and god knows if the farts were accurate and but i i don't know he was a talent he was he was quite a, and and you, did you remember him in the honeymoons when he would try to sign a contract of course oh, yeah. he would do all that Some whole of the, the best yeah. clowning oh, yeah. ever you yeah know? yeah wonderful yeah. stuff they were yeah. wonderful comic team yes him and gleason and that's yes. early in your career too i mean you're still a newbie actor and you're working with art carney and paul mazursky yeah that was the the third movie i did a fourth movie harry I did, and tonto right which we Jesus did Christ we, we should say yeah that was fun and uh, you know just a little word of advice for all you actors out there never improvise nude improvise nude scenes because <laughs> I, I you know i we were driving along. It was Art Carney's double and me and Melanie Mayron, and, and the, the rest of the the rest of the cast was taking the highway from like uh, this, the, from the Grand Canyon to Sedona, Arizona, and a beautiful country. And we we're taking all bat roads and getting shots. and And I said to Melanie, "Maybe I should give him a pressed ham here, you know." And she said, "Okay, <laughs> don't look." And I pulled down my pants and pressed my. Not quite big, pink, beautiful ass. Yeah. But uh, <laughs> press, press my butt against the thing, and I hear over the, the radio, do it again, do it again. And I do it again, you know, and I, ha ha, funny, funny. And then we, we get, no, we get to the Grand Canyon. And we get to the Grand Canyon, and Paul, um, who was in the, in, the, in the camera car behind me, said, oh, that was great. I said, what, you shot it? You, you shot He said, yeah. I said, well, how did it look? I said, oh, it was big and there was a pimple and a, a brown stain and looked terrible he said well you, you're not going to use it if it looked bad are you he said oh i think i'm going to have it on the poster and you know and I, 
I, I just I just felt so terrible. I said, oh no. Just, oh, yeah. Don't just suddenly take your pants off, you know. Just especially if there's a camera around. Especially if you're making minimum. You know, there are all these rules, but I don't know. It was fun. You work with some great directors, Josh. Yes, Paul I have. Paul Mazursky, you just yes, talked to about was, Norman Jewison. Was, I love Paul. Yeah, we're fans. Gilbert yeah, and I are I, big Mazursky fans. Yeah, I, 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 did, I did a very inappropriate thing with him. It's like <laughs> right when we were in uh, – I know you're shocked. <laughs> you can see the shock already. But we were, we were, um, we were in the Grand Canyon right after this, this thing with exposing my button – being informed that it might be the poster, which was a, a lie. Uh, and he was sitting with all the big wigs, and I was sitting with Melanie Mayeron, who I had a crush on. And um, I was carrying the, the pie, a, 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 a little pie, you know, some sort of, um, I forget the kind of pie it was, a lemon meringue. No, I don't. I was carrying <laughs> a lemon meringue pie back to the table, and Paul made some joke, going, look, our poster boy, or something. And I said, hey, Paul, did you ever see this old joke? And he said, what? And I hit him in the face with a pie in front of all the other, dire- you know, the assistant directors and the, all the producers and, the, you know, the, the table, the, the power table. And he was furious. He, was, he wiped the pie out of his head goes beyond humor. And I went, oh, shit. And, um, and I was right. Oh, yeah, shit yeah. was yes. the, the, the word of the day. And the casting director, um, oh, some famous Hollywood casting director, she had used me in like three movies uh, consecutively, and I never auditioned for her again. Lynn Chenoweth or something? No. Oh, uh, Ellen, yeah, Ellen, yeah. Ellen Chenoweth. Is that right? Is that something like I think that? so. I forget. I the casting director of uh, Harry and Tonto. We'll, we'll have our staff look it up. Okay. I think it's Ellen. Yeah. Yeah, something like that. Uh, she had her own casting. But anyway, she moved to... Yes. Ellen Chenoweth. Ellen Chenoweth. And, I, and I never auditioned for her again. But Paul and I would, you know, got, Paul got over it. I mean, we played cards after that, but... Uh, but she didn't. <laughs> I guess she didn't want to hire actors that assaulted the director. Uh, but you know, it takes all kinds in show business, doesn't it? And Jewison, we talked about, but you also worked for uh, Frank Perry, Alan Pakula. Frank Perry, yeah, yeah, Alan uh, Oliver Stone, Bob Fosse. Yes, yes, Bob Fosse was was quite a director. I mean, he could uh, he would actually cut because the camera wasn't moving fast enough. He, he knew what he knew what he was doing. I mean, he was he was very on top of things, you know, very very controlling. He was a choreographer, sure, you know? but he 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 was good. I think he really uh, and, and he would uh, he had no pity. I mean, he would he would he would run he would run you ragged, but you worked very hard. I mean, that the whole part I did in two days in Star Eighty you know, in Star Eighty, yeah. yeah. And and one movie where you had your name above the title, um, yeah, whether you wanted it or not, um, right? St- it's actually two, but go on. Okay, <laughs> Stooge Mania. Ah, uh, Stooge Mania. Well, I haven't finished watching it yet. <laughs> the, the problem was, I I saw the beginning. Oh, hilarious! And it was so bad. Someone asked if I they could borrow my copy, and I said sure. And that was like twenty two years ago. And I, <laughs> You played a, a guy obsessed with the three the three stooges. stooges. Yeah. Doesn't he see the three? Stooges? Isn't he having like hallucinations of seeing the three stooges in his in his in his normal life? I Wasn't that? Yes, that's what they, <laughs> they were driving for. Don't don't forget, I never saw that. That's the movie. right. You never I saw read it. the script. So you basically knew what you were doing when you were doing it. The check cleared. I knew what I was doing. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you knew this. This was not the next Citizen Kane when you. Oh, were I didn't yeah. think it was. No. Uh, yeah. I, I, I didn't know how it would turn out, but it turned out hateful. I, <laughs> I mean, it starts off with, with urinating and stuff. I mean, it's just not. I don't know. I. I but not, you got to work with Sid Caesar. Yes, I did. And Which is a uh, sad thing that that Sid Caesar would wind up in Stooge Working with me? Yeah. Well, <laughs> uh, well I, I, I resent that remark. Yeah. Uh, I, I thought um, he – I think he probably had some drug problems in his life. Oh, yeah. And uh, he was not taking drugs then. And uh, we, were, we were sitting together, and uh, he would go, you know – if you do it and it's bad for you, don't do it. 
you know, if it's making your life miserable, stop it. And you know, he was he was like giving these Profound. lessons from his life, you know. It wasn't Mousy Garner in Stooge Mania who had also worked with the with who? Mousy Garner. It was this, was a vaudevillian actor who had who had worked with Ted Healy in his original Stooges. Does the name ring a bell? He was uh, in Stooge it Mania. It does not, but maybe I wasn't paying attention. <laughs> uh, you know, that, that is also possible. Oh God! Um, what, yeah. what, what was the other movie that I you love had it. your name? Up oh, it was called Windy City, which uh, which is a tear which is actually a comedy about me dying. I suppose. No, it was starring John Shane, Kate Capshaw, and me. So I was above the title. Oh, oh I like that picture. It's sort of a sort of a big chill kind of a thing. Uh, Ar- Armin Bernstein make that yes, movie. Yes, you're yeah, right. I know that picture. It's a good film. <laughs> not not according to anyone who's else. But uh, okay. No, I we they they opened the film. What was that sound you just made? They opened the film in Chicago. <laughs> right. And I looked at the grosses in Variety, and I saw how many theaters there were, and I divided by the ticket price. Of the, it, I, f- I calculated that 11 people per showing <laughs> came to that in Windy City. The, the, the local support uh. that they counted on. Did not show up. No, it was not a very big hit. Uh, some people love that movie. Yeah, I remember seeing it when it came it. out. My look, I t- went to a screening of that <laughs> with a friend uh, uh, named Larry Price and my mother named Kate Mostel, and we took a cab home afterwards. And uh, Larry said, "What was the budget on that?" I said, "I think it was about eleven million or something like that." And they went, "God, can you imagine spending our money on stuff like that?" And my mother said, "Yeah, it gets me." Furious that, and they start yelling that people would spend money making that movie. And I was the star of it. You know, it's like you know, talk about home. Uh, yeah, these, I don't know, a life and show business. But anyway, they, it, it it was not a big hit. Although I was recognized in Buenos Aires by a guy. No, a guy oh, said, "Really? Oh my God! El, el hombre de el ciudad de vende en en mi casa." And he was, he gave me a free poster, and he was so moved. And so uh, there are a couple people that love that movie. I but. think it's a film worth seeing. I had good memories well, of it. Well, bless you. Yeah, it was, I, it was I, the eighties, wasn't it? Huh? It was the eighties? When it came out, Windy City. It was the eighties. The eighties. Yeah, we'll have our yeah, team. We'll have our be. team look it, it up. It's the eighties. I remember yes. liking it. I'm and, going the eighties. Okay. Well, thank you. You worked with someone who also worked with your father. A lot of people. And, uh, yeah. Hmm. Um, and this one it was George Siegel. Oh yeah, yeah. He owes me money, by the way. He does. George <laughs> Siegel owes you money. <laughs> okay. A little bit. Tell how how does he owe you money? Drug deal. <laughs> but but let's move on. <laughs> You did a series with George Siegel called Murphy's Law. I did. I did a series called Murphy's Law. And let me tell you, I don't know. I don't know what to tell you. We'd love to get him on the show, George Siegel. Oh, yeah. He's he's nice. He's funny, too. Um, Yeah. Yeah, we we worked on it. It was was not appreciated, the the series. And your dad did the hot rock with him. Yes, he did. Yeah. Yeah. Gilbert and I were talking about how much we liked Zero in that movie. Oh, yeah? The Hot Rock? Uh, I haven't seen that in a long time. Yeah. What, what I remember about the Hot Rock is I lived in Crown Heights at the time. I was a kid in Crown Heights, and they were filming it at the Brooklyn Museum. And I would go there every night with my sisters to watch them film that. <laughs> oh, yeah? <laughs> well, it's one of those movies like the ones we talk about where you see old New York. Oh, yes, yeah. yes. Right, and, and Ron Liebman and Siegel and... Uh, and Paul Sands. Right, and, right, and Seth that, Allen. Yeah. And I think Moses Your buddy, Gunn. Moses Gunn. Yes, your favorite actor. Yes. <laughs> Gilbert loves Moses Gunn. Really? <laughs> yes. <laughs> cool. And since we talked about this is something else that that Gilbert and I are fond of. Since we talked about uh, Delta House, uh, a, a failed series, <laughs> we have, one of many. We have to ask you about you're at the top with two oh with my God, two yeah. of our other yes. podcast guests, Greg I, Evigan and Paul Schaefer. Yes, they 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 
they they had it on TV, and but they had been fired by that time. I had well, you were in the music video. I did video. the pilot. I did yeah. the pilot, and yeah. then uh, and then they they wised up and replaced me with uh, I don't know because an, 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 an anatomic cat or something. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what, but uh, we were watching I was out of the sketch. Uh, we had Greg one Evigan of the on musical the show. scenes. Then yeah. Greg Evigan is. Uh, you know, he's singing. He's the handsome. Well, he's yeah. on the drums, and Josh yeah. is playing the. And and and, and Don Scardino was the Don boy. Scardino. Oh yes, right, right. Yes. director now. Yeah. And Paul Schaefer is he's there in like very funny. Yeah, he's there in a tight rubber suit. Well, you know, yeah. Paul. I mean, he's funny, <laughs> yeah. but he's a little strange. But it was, a, it, it was his Elton and, John and El- face. Yes, yeah. Yeah, yeah, the Elton John glasses. <laughs> And you were playing the fiddle. I mean, we were doing the research yes, for Greg and Evigan, play the and you turned up. I do play the violin. Yeah. In fact, in uh, Harry and Tonto, I have a little violin playing going on. If you want to rent that, you can see me play the violin. There's a hey. music video of you and Greg and Paul and oh, yeah. Scardino doing a song huh. from, from You're at the Top. It's, yeah. it's just surreal. It, it's worth watching. Really? For, oh, well, for the go. wrong reasons, me. <laughs> oh, well, I, that, that's... <laughs> That's why I got in the business. <laughs> uh, I'll tell you a great story uh, about the violin. I think it's a great story. Um, I knew a little funny thing. It's the thing I do in, in Harry and Tonto where I play... Uh, um, and then you do a left-hand pizzicato while you twirl your bow. Bum, bum, the weasel, you know. And it's very funny to look at because you're making sound while you're not playing the violin, mm-hmm. it seems. And uh, I was in the New York Youth Symphony Orchestra when I was in high school. And uh, it, in Carnegie Hall, we had a concert, and the soloist was Itzhak Perlman. And I wasn't a great violinist, but I was good enough to be able to recognize genius. And uh, I loved him, and he played so well. And I was sitting right next to him, and I was in the first stand of the seconds. And uh, at one point, I woke to him and said, it's Huck. Um, my name's Josh Mostel, and let me show you something. If you ever go on Johnny Carson, <laughs> this is a great thing to do. And I did. Da-dum, 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 da-dum. And I did this funny little left-handed uh, pits thing. And he laughed. And, oh, that's fine. I said, use it. Do whatever you want. It's yours now. And uh, he did it on Johnny Carson. Oh, my God. Yeah, that's my claim to musical fame. <laughs> yeah, other than the year at the top thing, but... You should check out the video. Are, are you writing writing things? You, these just, people you're going to apologize to? Yeah, I'm going to. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah, oh, thing, Bruno Gertie, things I'm going to oh, apologize to you about. Yeah. yeah, tell us a little bit about Bruno because Gilbert and I uh, well, enjoyed uh, him, loved he, him in the he freshman. Was very and, sweet. He was. His father was a. Uh, oh, oh, Bruce Kirby's his father, right? He was also an actor. Do I have that right? I know all this stuff. Yeah, yeah. Uh, he was an actor, but he was also a maitre d. That I, I didn't know. A maitre d. It, it, Somewhere, I mean, he Bruno had sort of a, a maitre d personality in some ways that I think he got from his father. Like, if you went to his house, he was very solicitous. He would always help you. Can I get you anything? It was very, very nice like that. Um, he, he was just a, a sweet guy. But I was, I was there when he and he and um, um, Billy Crystal. He got furious at Billy. He never, never yelled at him, but he wouldn't do the sequel because because uh, Billy insulted him. Oh, you know what? What did he say? You know something? Uh, it was a little scene, and uh, Bruno had a line. And before he said the line, he very carefully wiped his mouth and then said the line. And I think Billy went <laughs> pretended to yawn, Ooh. like off camera or something like that, or, or described it and. Uh, Bruno was, I mean, he never, he'd never reacted. He was a real gentleman, Bruno. He never reacted, but he never, he turned out a million dollars for the sequel. Wow. He wouldn't do it. On principle. How about yeah, that? Yeah, he didn't want to. How about he didn't that? Wanna, and he was best friends with Billy before that. Well, there he is, and Harry met yeah. Sally, too. Yeah. That, well, then they worked together. Yeah. Right. And he was the young Clemenza in the Godfather sequel, which people forget. Yes, yes. And you worked with Meryl Streep. Oh yeah, I did. Yeah, yeah, sure. And Sophie's she, I, choice. She, I don't think she looked at me once in that. <laughs> but you know, her character wouldn't. I mean, Meryl. Of course, Meryl's not the kind of. Well, I'll tell you a great story about Meryl. God, I'm giving away all my secrets. <laughs> I want to save a little something for someone <laughs> somewhere. But I'll tell you this story. Um, there was a scene in uh, Sophie's Choice uh, where. Um, 
where Sophie and uh, Nathan, I think his name is, are having a big fight. Nathan is, of course, you know, uh, has mental problems, and you know. Anyway, they, they all day we they were they were rehearsing in stage combat, and you know, they said it's a big violent scene. We're not gonna, you know, we're not gonna block it out, and they were gonna shoot. We were inside. They were going to start inside the house and run out in the street. And they just put a camera in the street and lit up the street in Brooklyn. And they were just going to shoot it in the master and and shoot it on the street. This this yelling and screaming scene about. It. He calls her a cunt and throws money at her and runs off. And then Stingo comes up to me and says, "What happened?" I go, "He's Miss Sugar now. Oh, he threw money at her and called her a cunt." You know, and the same thing that happened. I repeat, and it was ultimately cut out of the movie. But uh, but anyway, the big violent scene, and so it started with Stingo outside, um, uh, Meryl Streep and Kevin Klein inside, and me inside, and all the crew was outside, and um, and they, they go, all right, we got light, we got speed, and, and right before they call action, Meryl turns around and hits Kevin Klein in the face, whap, and Kevin, he, 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 he closes his finish, and then she runs out the door. And he ah, runs after her, you know. But it's like um, she just hit him. She wanted a little reaction from him, and I, I, I'm not sure she even got it. But uh, wow. But but you know, she's. Uh, I would say she's a killer, not maybe <laughs> literally, but uh, you know, something she's going to be good. And if, <laughs> I think she's got and potential. If not, and if you're not on the program, <laughs> you better get on it. You think she's you going know, she's places? A, she's a smart. Tough cookie, I would think. Meryl. That's, that's my Meryl story. Meryl hitting Kevin. <laughs> Any, anybody else you want to know about? Well, I want to ask you about Radio Days, which is a film that I love okay. ver- very much. And you were hilarious as un- Uncle Thank Abe, uncle the fish-obsessed uncle. The fish-obsessed uncle. Uh, the one th- the thing I... Mu- oh, my God. It- Show business is hard. Uh, I, I remember. <laughs> Do you feel that way about this show? <laughs> no, this is pretty easy. Okay, so well, good. I'm, t- I'm talking. I can talk. Uh, but, we appreciate um, it. They were having. Uh, uh, let's see. How do, I, how do we tell this? Uh, uh, what am I talking about? Oh, a uh, rated <laughs> Uncle Abe. Um, Uncle. So there, there was a scene where uh, I go off, and I, I. The, the neighbors are making a lot of noise on uh, on a holy day on Yom Kippur, and, you know, you're not supposed to play the radio, and they're playing the radio, and I go over there to yell at them and say, you know, put it, uh, 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 and I come back, and I'm a communist, you know, like them. I, they seduce me with apple pie or cherry pie, and, it, and you know, and I, 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 why are we being quiet? It's them, it's the, you know, and it, it's, it's a very funny scene, and uh, we were doing take after take after take, and I would kind of, what do you go? All right, just try to do the lines as fast as you can. I had a lot of lines, and I would do them and do them. We got 18, 20, 22 takes, and then finally we, we finish it, and uh, the the the, um, the the person, the uh, the the coordinator, who you know, the script supervisor. Yeah. That's the word. The script supervisor says, uh, "Do you want us to print any of the last four takes?" He goes, "No." <laughs> And you know, I feel terrible. I mean, I just felt like I like I had let him down and let wasn't any good. And and he never said anything. Uh, you know, he's not a very verbal kind of guy in a lot of ways. But um, I, I think he just didn't like his writing. But you know, you're an actor. You feel everything's about you. So sure. I, you know, I I kept thinking before tech. I don't have to do this for a living. I don't have to do this for a living. You know, but uh, apparently I do. <laughs> yeah. but anyway. I, I love the Edgar Bergen thing. He's a ventriloquist on the radio. <laughs> oh, yeah. How do you know his lips yeah. not? He's not yeah. moving his lips. And, and that, was, that was an interesting thing because uh, the script, which I never saw, of course, but uh, apparently the beginning of the movie, it starts with a great joke when people are, are, are robbing a house and they steal all the furniture, yeah. but a phone call comes and it's yeah. a quiz show. Yeah, it's great. And they answer the question, and they and these people come home, and all their furniture stolen. And a day later, all new furniture comes. <laughs> right, that's great. <laughs> the quiz show, you know. And that originally, I think, was on page eighty, you know. And the the opening of the movie, apparently, uh, I hear from second hand, uh, was a, a foggy day when they they spot a sub off of Coney Island, and they never got the foggy day, and they. Uh, 
So he just takes another thing from the middle and puts it in the beginning. He, you I mean, you a, never saw the complete script? He would only give the actors their, their sides? I think they're special actors that uh-huh. get the whole script. But uh-huh. the unspecial actors, like I'm raising my hand for those of you <laughs> on the radio, uh, they, we just got our sides. Well, the game show comes back later because Diane Weiss shows up yeah. on the game show and she, she stumbles onto the fish category. and She knows everything. Oh. You remember this in the movie? And no, she knows everything about I fish. See it again. It oh, it's just movie. such a... Oh, it's just so such a terrific movie. Uh, yeah, that, that, that was a nice one. Uh, no, folks, see Radio Days if you haven't seen it. It's yes, ter- see ter- everything. Terrific. Do everything. And our pal you know, Danny Aiello is funny in that. We had Danny on the show, too. Danny? Aiello. Oh. Who's funny in that. Yeah. Yeah. It's a, it's a very sad ending. I mean, that film moves me because it's really yeah. about, it's about a dying art. It's about radio going away. It's dying radio. What the, what the hell am I doing here? Yeah. This is not radio. Where are the cameras? I keep wondering. Um, yeah. Radio There's that days. great bit at the end, the dialogue, where he says every, with every passing New Year's Eve, their voices get dimmer yeah. and dimmer. I, I remember, you know, we just had the sides and, and you know, and, uh, and uh, uh, who played my wife? Oh, gosh. Is it, was it Wendy Jo Sperber? No. No, who I'm thinking of. It was, she was great. Oh, she's funny. Yeah, she can't is. can't think of her name. And anyway. Well, uh, we're Googling it. We were just, we were talking, and, uh, you know, we're saying, well, how should we do this? She said, well, let's use this Long Island accent. I mean, they're the Jews from Long Island. You know, so we have this Brooklyn accent we were doing. And uh, the first time we ran through it, Woody says, so let's one to one through it, and, and we do it with this. Brooklyn accent, and what he says, are you going to do that? (laughs) (laughs) And I said, uh, uh, not now. (laughs) So we did not use any kind of discernible accent. Uh, But it's funny. I think he's not the kind of person that would tell you to, to not to give notes and say, don't do it like that. He's the kind of person that would just fire you and get someone that did it the way you'd like it. But uh, he certainly didn't like our first run through. I, I heard that Woody is the kind of director that'll hire an actor, like a lead actor, and somewhere in the middle of the movie, just get rid of him. That he's Well, he's done that a bunch of yeah. times, I think. I, I think it's because he doesn't... I, he doesn't want to really get into a thing where I tell you what to do. and da-da. He doesn't want to have to negotiate, maybe, yeah. with an actor like like most directors do, you know. Uh, he just says, it's not working. We'll do it. You know, I, th- I think he looks for someone to, to bring it all to the project. But I, I really don't know. But he was uh, certainly a talented guy, isn't he? Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Was, was it Renee Lippin? Oh, yeah. yeah. Rini. Rini. Rini Lippin. Rini. Yeah. Yes, Rini. Yeah, I apologized. Uh, no, I, I apologized. I think she was Wendy Joe Sperber. Well, I should have known her name. I mean, you know, one of my favorite wives. It's a terrific film, and the cast is just... It's actually the only Woody Allen film that has both Mia Farrow and Diane Keaton in it. So it's notable for that. Really? Yeah. And Julie Kavner. Julie Kavner's great. Michael Tucker's the great. Simpsons. All your, yeah, yeah. yeah. Every, all, all nine yards. I love that picture. Oh, thank you. Gilbert? Guess, Gilbert? I guess we'll just do a quick... Uh, see if there's any one people left out. God. Oh, I just remembered something. What? I did a voiceover for this commercial for ESPN with the dogs playing cards. And I didn't work with him, but one of the other voices was Art Carney. Oh, really? Of another dog. And that, and now you, you just stirred something in my head that... This woman who was doing the recording, or the recording people there were going, that he was doing like, during the thing, like a, a bride on her honeymoon farting. Yeah! There you go. It's all coming back. There you go. And, and can you imitate the fart? I, oh, it would, be, it would be very dainty. Yeah. And it would be hidden. It would be, you know, that you could, it would be like... Uh, uh, a minuscule can, fart, can, a minimalist can, can fart. Can I give you some actors and you see if you can imitate their farts? Oh, I hate, I hate stealing another actor's routine. Yeah, but okay. yeah go ahead, let's do it. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> oh, <God>. Humphrey Bogart. <laughs> you know, a masculine fart. With I don't lisp. care. I'm just going to fart. <laughs> Vincent Price. <laughs> it, it sounded a little like an elk. Wouldn't it? Like a, you know, like body dum, body dum, 
But <laughs> well, you know, something like that. <laughs> You know, a, a clarion call to arms, perhaps. Something like that. Uh, Brando. Brando. Yeah. Uh, it would be a grunt fart. Yeah. <laughs> and then when you think it's over, <laughs> it, it kind of wouldn't end. You know, I think it would be a, it would, it would be a, a repeater. They're, they're called repeaters in the, in the... Clark Gable. Clark Gable. Well, he had those ears. I think if he really farted, his ears would flap. You know? <laughs> Maybe you would have a plappity fart. I mean, I'm just guessing here, you know. Al Pacino. Al Pacino. I mean, he he would have a method fart. It depended what part he would play, and the man would fart in character. Right. You know. Dustin would probably crap his pants, too, but he is really method. But. Now, wait a minute. Speaking of Dustin. Oh, what? Is, I mentioned Dustin? Yeah. Here's something. Was he, Gilbert and I were talking. Was he, this is a, this is a, was he originally cast, uh, as the, this is about your dad's film, about the producers. Was he originally cast as the playwright in the Kenneth Mars role? Because that's what we heard. I don't know. And left to be the graduate? <laughs> well, I don't know. No. <laughs> If he did, he made the right choice. <laughs> uh, no, nah, I have no idea about that. Okay. More okay. importantly, More. Meryl Streep farting. I would, wouldn't, wouldn't she have someone to do that for her? <laughs> I mean... <laughs> uh, I, you know, I, I've lived with women for decades and haven't heard them fart. Somewhere. You know, some people just... And where is... Oh, I'll tell you a good fart story. Uh, <laughs> okay. Someone said to uh, my mother, said, Katie, uh, do, you, do you sleep late? She said, oh, no, I'm up with a 7 o'clock fart. <laughs> you know, because zero had, uh, zero's farts were, <laughs> they were, they were, you know, bull, bull moose farts, I would say. <laughs> Very really similar to Teddy Roosevelt. Really? Really? Yeah, yeah. Bull Bull party. farts. Really? You know, yeah, it would sound like yeah, the 7 o'clock fart. It was like the, the whole neighborhood would get up. and you know, Anyway, that was mom. Mel Gibson farting. Mel Gibson farting. Well, that's an anti-Semitic kind of a... Yeah, I was, just, yeah. I was wondering. It's kind of like a... I, 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 I don't know about Mel. <laughs> fart with a Nazi haven't we, salute. Haven't we done farting yet? <laughs> We're not done farting. No, okay. Done. How about your fart? Describe your fart. What's your fart like? Uh, your fart. Your fart with a little staccato. <laughs> little little staccato farts, don't you think? Hilarious. <laughs> I'm out of questions. You're out of questions. <laughs> yeah. Well, I have 14 answers to go, so just I don't know. All right. Well, yeah. Whatever you want. I'm 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 at, I'm your I'm your I'm your farting servant. <laughs> I was going to ask you a lot of obscure stuff, but that's probably a better way to close. Right. Well, while we're on it, uh, Robert Mitchum farting. Well, gosh, I don't know what Robert Mitchum. <laughs> I think it would be, you know, it would be short. Yeah, like to, you know, I, not too much I'm, 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 I'm not interested in farting, son. You know, if you want one, there it is. You know. This program brought to you by Heinz Beans. But for, for if you have, oh Lord, oh, very funny. Well, well Brian Koppelman was right. He was. He told us you got to get Josh on the show, and here you are, and you delivered. Oh well, God, Brian, baby. Does Brian owe you something? You told us. Oh yeah, yeah. My book, get it back. I, I, an Amarillo Slim book. I, you know, he's a card player. Yeah, so, yeah. Uh, we saw Rounders, yeah. which you were in. Yes, I was. We had a whole bunch of weird stuff, but we'll do it another time. Okay. On a second show. Oh, okay. Uh-huh. Uh, okay. <laughs> I, okay. <laughs> you want to wrap the show as me? You know, wrap the show as, as you. Uh, uh, well, how do you wrap the show? I've okay. never heard of it. Hi, I'm Gilbert Godfrey. Hi, I'm Gilbert Godfrey. <laughs> oh, that's pretty good. And you're not. So why don't we, why don't you stay, listen, just listen next week, because it's even going to be funnier. We, we've got a guy who, who doesn't imitate farts, he actually farts. So, and you won't be able to smell it because it's radio. And we haven't even thought of how to make the, the fart smells go over the airwaves. <laughs> So that'll be good. I love it. It's Gilbert by way of young Jerry Lewis. <laughs> That's great.
<laughs> oh, well. <laughs> Funny. Well, uh, I guess that's pretty much it. <laughs> <laughs> anyway. <laughs> uh, we've, we've covered it all? Yeah. Okay. I want you to know my wife's favorite movie line is scoop of vanilla. Scoop of chocolate. Don't waste my time. There you go. Yeah. Thanks for People saying. People ask it. me all the time. Do they? Yeah. yeah. What what goes with this? And, uh, ask the writers. Right. I mean, I'm I'm just a mere actor. Babalu right? and uh, yeah yeah. That was a good script. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> good stuff, Josh. Well, Thank you. Stuff. Thank you for well, doing it. I'm Gilbert Gottfried and Frank Santos. <laughs> oh, no, I'm Gilbert Gottfried. <laughs> you knew he was going to do that. I am. <laughs> Not that guy laughing. <laughs> can, can you say? And we've been talking to Zero Must. Uh, we've been talking. To, we've Not been now, talking. I can't. The son of Zero. <laughs> Way to go, Gilbert! Really <laughs> fuck that one up. This is Gilbert Gottfried, and we've been talking to Josh Mustel, who's sitting on two seats next to me. Uh, and thank you very much, Josh. Oh, you're welcome, Gilbert. <laughs> okay, come back. And by the way, we have an honorarium of $12,000 for you. Oh, that's very generous, Gilbert. <laughs> oh, I knew you'd like it. <laughs> 12000 yeah, I can oh, dream. Wow. I? Yeah, really. I can dream. <laughs> Thank you, Josh Mostel. This okay. was a, this was fun. I, I can't top that. <laughs>